Good morning. It's Wednesday, March 25th, 2020, and we're here at home. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not at work. Um, it's been interesting, but actually I'm enjoying myself at home. I do some, I check work emails, I correspond with people at work, I fill out some insurance documents. Uh, I've been, I don't, I'm not busy all day, but I'm trying. Anyways, I thought I would try something that our one of my fellow staff is doing with children's books. She's reading children's books online. Um, so anyways, I thought I'd try it with adult level material. I like short stories because they keep my attention. I don't have a long attention span. Call it, a, call it adult uh, attention deficit, if you will. Anyways, I used to be a teacher. I'm sort of a word nerd, especially when I was teaching. I mean, I'd be teaching and reading textbooks with the kids during class, and all of a sudden I'd stop, went on the internet, uh, I had a whiteboard, and so on the internet I'd look up a word, and we'd look at the definition, all the definitions, we'd look at the origin of the word, and the kids would just thought, oh, Mr. Griffin, you're crazy. I would always tell them it perturbably, you know, words have meanings. If you don't know a meaning of a word, you can get fooled in life. And so we discussed the words, and finally some one student or another would say, Mr. Griffin, can we just get on reading this so we get done with it, please? <laughs> so anyways, that's my experience with being a word nerd. I like words. Another example of using words, especially idioms and puns, uh, is with children. My brother's oldest son was very young, I don't know, three, four, five, six years old, and he had said something bad. My brother looked at him and said, hey, watch your mouth. And I guess the story was told by my brother to me that his son walked around for an hour or two with his eyes down to his mouth, trying to see his mouth. And my brother asked him, what are you doing? And the son replied, he told me to look at my mouth, to watch my mouth, Dad. With that, I'll go on to what I wanted to read you today. I found some material on public domain, so I'm pretty sure I don't have to get permission to read this and put it on my Facebook. If I do, I guess sue me, you know. We're in dire straits here, dire times, if you will, but it's not all bad. There are some good things in every day that we go through. The title is The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick. He is a science fiction writer and he wrote many science fiction novels, short stories, etc. A lot of them are for magazines and a lot of them are on public domains. So I'm reading one now called The Eyes Have It. And if you will see the eyes, oop, it looks like it might be backwards. The Eyes Have It, E-Y-E-S. Here we go. It was quite by accident I discovered this incredible invasion of Earth by life forms from another planet. And as yet, I haven't done anything about it. I can't think of anything to do. I wrote to the government, and they sent back a pamphlet on the repair and maintenance of frame houses. Anyhow, the whole thing is known. I'm not the first to discover it. Maybe it's even under control. I don't know. I was sitting in my easy chair, idly turning the pages of a paperback book someone had left on the bus when I came across the reference that first put me on the trail. For a moment, I did not respond. It took some time for the full import to sink into me. After I'd comprehended, it seemed odd, and I hadn't noticed it right away. The reference was clearly to a non-human species of incredible properties, not indigenous to the earth. A species, I hasten to point out, customarily masquerading as ordinary human beings. Their disguise, however, became transparent in the face of the following observations by the author. It was, as, uh, it, was, it was at once obvious the authors knew everything, knew everything and was taking it in his stride. The line, and I tremble, remember it now as I read it, said, his eyes slowly roved around the room. Vague chills assailed me. I tried to picture the eyes. Did they roll like dimes? The passage indicated not. They seemed to move through the air not over the surface, rather rapidly, apparently. No one in the story was surprised. 
That's what tipped me off. No sign of amazement at such an outrageous thing. Later, the matter was amplified. His eyes moved from person to person. There it was in a nutshell. The eyes had clearly come apart from the rest of him and were on their own. My heart pounded and my breath choked in my windpipe. I had stumbled on an accidental, an accidental mention of a totally unfamiliar race, obviously non-terrestrial. Yet, to the characters in the book, it was perfectly natural, which suggested they belonged to the same species. And the author? A slow suspicion burned in my mind. The author was taking it rather too easily in his stride. Evidently, he felt this was quite a usual thing. He made absolutely no attempt to conceal his knowledge, and the story continued thus. Presently, his eyes fastened on Julia. <laughs> Julia, being a lady, had at least the breeding to feel indignant. She is described as blushing and knitting her brows angrily. At this, I sighed with relief. Oh, there weren't, they weren't all non-terrestrials. The narrative continues. Slowly, calmly, his eyes examined every inch of her. Great Scott! Here the girl turned and stomped off and the matter ended. I lay back in my chair, gasping with horror. My wife and family regarded me in wonder. What's wrong, dear? My wife asked. I couldn't tell her. Knowledge like this was too much for the ordinary run-of-the-mill person. I had to keep it to myself. Nothing, I gasped. I leaped up, snatched the book, and hurried out of the room. In the garage, I continued reading. There was more, trembling. I read the next revealed and reve I read the next revealing passage. He put his arm around Julia. Presently, she asked him if he would remove his arm. He immediately did so with a smile. It's not said what was done with the arm after the fellow had removed it. Maybe it was left standing upright in a corner. Maybe it was thrown away. I don't care. In any case, the full meaning was there, staring me right in the face. Here was a race of creatures capable of removing portions of their anatomy at will, eyes, arms, and maybe more, without batting an eyelash. My knowledge of biology came in handy. At this point, Obviously, they were simple beings, unicellular, unicellular, some sort of primitive single-celled things, beings no more developed than starfish. Starfish can do the same thing, you know. I read on and came to this incredible revelation, tossed off coolly by the author without the faintest tremor, and it reads, Outside the movie theater, we split up. Part of us went inside, part over to the, to the cafe for dinner. Binary fission, obviously, splitting in half and forming two entities. Probably each lower half went to the cafe, being it was farther, and the upper halves to the movies. I read on, hands shaking. I r had really stumbled onto something here. My mind reeled as I made out this next passage. I'm afraid there's no doubt about it. Poor Bibney has lost his head again, which was followed by, and Bob says he has utterly no guts. Yet Bibney got around as well as the next person. The next person, however, was just as strange. He was soon described thus, totally lacking in brains. There was no doubt of the thing in the next passage. Julie, whom I had thought to be the one normal person, reveals herself as also being an alien life form similar to the rest. Quite deliberately, Julie had given her heart to the young man. It didn't relate what the final disposition of the order, organ was, but I didn't really care now. It was evident Julie had gone right on living in her usual manner, like all the others in the book, without heart, arms, eyes, brains, viscera, dividing up in two when the occasion demanded, without a qualm. Thereby, she gave him her hand. I sickened. The rascal now had her hand as well as her heart. I shuddered to think what he's done with them by this time. He took her arm. Not content to wait, he had to start dismantling her on his own. Flushing crimson, I slammed the book shut and leaped to my fate, but not in time to escape one last reference to those carefree bits of anatomy whose travels had originally thrown me on the track. 
Her eyes followed him all the way down the road and across the meadow. I rushed from the garage and back inside the warm house as if the cursed things were following me. My wife and children were playing Monopoly in the kitchen. I joined them and played with frantic fervor, brow feverish, teeth chattering. I had had enough of the thing. I want to bear no more of it. Let them come on. Let them invade the earth. I don't want to get mixed up in it. I have absolutely no stomach for it. That's it, short and sweet. I thought it was pretty enjoyable. Uh, look up some words as you come across from reading today, whether it's in the news accounts of this uh, virus, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, whatever you want to call it. I call it the disease or the virus. Why name it, you know? Anyways, look up some words. It's fun. Um, hope you have a good day. I'm thinking about all my coworkers, my family, my, all my neighbors and relatives, all those who are near and dear to me. And anyways, peace and blessings throughout your day.